Hi, my name is Rick Rosso. I hold the India Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, as you know, if you're watching this program, you're probably familiar. Uh, our work here at CSIS focuses a lot on India's uh, development trajectory and also quite a bit on what's happening at the uh, subnational level. India is obviously in the front pages uh, all over the news these days as uh, the country surpasses China as the world's most populous nation. Um, when you consider that, you know, paired with the uh, other fundamental shifts that are happening, uh, multiple decades of average of 6% growth rate, as well as what appears to be, you know, India sitting on the verge of a major wave of industrialization as we begin to see countries looking for uh, uh, finding other options for their global supply chains, uh, programs in India like the, uh, um, uh, the Production Linked Incentive Program. Yeah, there's a lot happening right now that puts India certainly on the uh, front page as we think about the, the immediate future and, and looking out a little bit further for global development, uh, India will be in the limelight for a long period of time. Youth sustained growth over two plus decades. Uh, I think this question that's always been on the tip of everybody's tongues, will this uh, population be a, a, a dividend or will it potentially be a bomb? I think it's really started to shift over to the dividend uh, quotient uh, in, in recent days. Uh, and that's terrific to see. Now, far too often as we think about what's gonna trigger this wave of development in India, we focus a lot on what's happening in Delhi with the national government. And while certainly a lot of the big objectives and initiatives happen from Delhi, states play a critical role in this as well. And uh, it is such a great pleasure of mine to host uh, Suman Berry, who is Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog. Uh, Suman, of course, has been a friend of mine for 25 years, one of my original gurus, uh, back when I was a young staffer at the U.S. India Business Council and he was running NCAER. Uh, he would always be the first stop when we'd have these business delegations showing up in Delhi to get the economic perspective of what was happening. Uh, it's been thrilling, of course, to see all the great things that Suman has done you know, before then at the World Bank, but post that, uh, since uh, advising the government, both in the Prime Minister's office as well as the Reserve Bank of India, uh, as the uh, Chief Global Economist for Shell, uh, and of course, uh, advisory to many uh, think tanks around the world. So this idea of cooperative competitive federalism is the topic of the day, and there's no better person we could have to help us cover this than Suman Berry. Suman, thank you uh, for coming here. And uh, we'd love to hear some opening thoughts you may have. And of course, I've got a lot of questions that uh, both for my own thought as well as those that friends have uh, thrown to me over the last couple of weeks when they knew this event was coming up. So thank you, sir, and welcome to Washington. Uh, Rick, uh, very pleased to be here, not only because of our friendship, but because of the quality of the work that the Wadwani Chair uh, and the, now the CSIS India program does. I think you uh, have long experience with India, but more importantly, a, f a large part of your program has been on Indian, India states. And I've just come off um, a week of speaking on college campuses uh, in, in, the, in India, and I've been repeating uh, what Prime Minister Modi has to say, which is that um, India doesn't grow, India's states grow, and when India's states grow, uh, India will grow. Um, and Niti Aayog is very much the glue in that relationship. So uh, just from the point of view of opening remarks, I'd like to explain a little bit what Niti Aayog is, how it came into existence. Uh, the theory, if you like, behind cooperative and competitive federalism and then I think in the conversation we're going to get into what does that mean up close, how does it really work, assuming that, that you think that that's what your audience would be interested in. So um, I've been in the role a year. I'm the third vice chairman of Niti Aayog. Uh, and vice chairman me, uh, is because the prime minister is the chairman. Niti Aayog should be thought of as a startup, to use the modern language. <laughs> um, it is true that it still inhabits the uh, premises of what was the Planning Commission, but the challenge uh, facing my predecessors and myself is actually to reimagine the institution uh, for the exciting times ahead. Reimagine why and in what way. Um, and the Planning Commission, uh, as its term indicated, was very much organized around the notion which eroded after the 1991 reforms, but that the government was in the driver's seat and 
frankly, this was quite common in development thinking uh, in the 50s when the Planning Commission was set up. But there was a decisive turn away from that in 1991, and the private sector uh, was seen to have a much more important role. But for, if you like, reasons of inertia, the plans continued to be produced. That had the collateral consequence that states had to come cap in hand to the Planning Commission because it was a, 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 a grant dispensing body. And uh, many chief ministers felt that this was slightly demeaning. I mean, they, are, um, they have important responsibilities and they are politically elected. So uh, when Prime Minister Modi was elected in 2014, uh, he determined that the old planning commission should be abolished. And as of the 1st of January 2015, uh, my organization, Niti Ayog, came into existence. Uh, and just to explain what the, um, what the name means, um, it's, a, it's a pun, because in English, Niti is an acronym for the National Institution for Transforming India. But in Hindi uh, and Sanskrit, Niti is policy, and Ayog is, um, is again Hindi for commission. So it's a policy commission. And you, if you know Australia, they've had a productivity commission. And um, uh, so that's the shift in focus. It's about ideas, practical ideas, but uh, also very much to be, as I was saying before, the glue between the center uh, and the states. And so we can get into what that means, um, you know, practically, uh, if you wish. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think having a former chief minister as the prime minister, uh, that shift. I don't remember uh, a lot of people on the sidelines saying, you know, the shift away from planning commission to this body. It, it feels like something that, um, you know, kind of got drummed up uh, almost kind of naturally. You know, it wasn't one of those big reforms that I think people were uh, knocking the door about, I think, prior to the government coming in. When you look at, you know, this, this way that you as the institution that has such a great responsibility on engaging state governments, and, and our program, you know, you run across a lot of states and they they're, 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 uh, have such great uh, development issues that they sit in front of, do you find with your organization, is it push versus pull? Do you find you're running out to the state governments and talking about things that are evolving and shifting and selling them ideas? Or do states at this point, you know, now that you're the, the third vice chairman, the body's been around for a while, do they raise their hand and, and ask for, you know, cooperation and assistance in areas that they make sense? Or is it a mix of both? I realize that could be the case as well. So what's the push versus pull in your organization versus uh, uh, states? Uh, three points. Uh, one about the collective uh, and then uh, about where we are. And third, where states, I think, want us to head. Um, about the collective, uh, yes, the Prime Minister is our chairperson, but we have a governing council. And uh, there are a select number of union ministers who are on that governing council, but every chief minister and every administrator of a union territory is a ex officio member of that council. And this is important. I mean, certain countries, federal countries, Australia, Brazil, they have formal mechanisms for the interaction between states and um, uh, provinces um, and uh, in, the, in what they call in Australia the Commonwealth government. We have now created a mechanism like that in the so-called GST Council, but in, Turkey, in talking about development strategy, NITI's governing council both substantively and symbolically represents that, uh, if you like, uh, the development of a consensus on the direction ahead. Um, Prime Minister uh, Modi calls this team India, and that's important for the following reason, and it's important for Niti's location or positioning, rather, I should say, which is that, uh, and God knows you know that in this country, that in the political space, there are sharp and rancorous divisions. But uh, his mandate 
to me, to Niti, and it's accepted by the chief ministers, is that we are all involved in a common enterprise. Um, and that common enterprise is also politically functional because if states grow, then people get reelected. And you're the person who pointed out to me that uh, you know uh, anti-incumbency has been waning, so economic performance does seem to be mattering more. Uh, all of which is therefore to say that we see chief ministers as development practitioners, whereas in the uh, public eye they are all you know, political figures. And I can tell you it's an impressive, I don't need to tell you, but I need to tell your audience <laughs> what an impressive bunch of development practitioners these are. Mm. I mean, uh, they know their numbers, they know their policies, they, uh, they know what works politically, I suppose like a US governor does, uh, mm. as it were. But uh, with a, um, so that's the collective. So we engage with the collective and provide a space where there can be a discussion. And there, there are various uh, kind of substructures, but the governing council. Then uh, we get to how they wanted to use Niti up to this time. And a lot of it is actually troubleshooting with central ministries, mm. okay? Because... Um, you know, the big states, the important states, they have their resident uh, commissioners in Delhi, so they, they know how to work Delhi. But even medium-sized states, uh, you know, basically feel uh, that they need an advocate in Delhi. And so they have been using Niti quite a bit for that. So that would be the push element, okay? And we have a structure in terms of advisors and uh, certain states I handle myself. Uh, my visits are a little bit more ceremonial and symbolic, but again, it's to reflect the fact that you have, as it were, a technocratic commissioner in Delhi, not just the, you know, as it were, the local resident commissioner. And it's important then that they know that I have access to other ministers and that I have access to the prime minister. So if something is egregious enough, we would uh, be able to give it a hearing. Mm -hmm. Now to, so if that's the way they have wanted to uh, use us up till now, w n the call has come, uh, particularly uh, in the last year or year and a half, encouraged by the Prime Minister, people have been saying that, look, you have transformed your function, help us transform our planning ministries into visioning entities. And some states have, have gone really quite far with this. And so they are asking us to be informal advisors. And the guidance from the prime minister is very clear. It's not cookie cutter, not a template when they want you. Uh, but we are, and we've been given resources uh, in the union budget. So for example, to support intellectual support by local universities, IIMs, IITs. And so that's, as it were, the, uh, uh, the way we hope to engage in the future. Oh, that, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering, you mentioned about the chief minister's own sort of interest, knowledge of numbers, development interest. The global issues that are kind of impacting us all right now, you know, the desire for investors to find, you know, that China plus one strategy for manufacturing, climate change, so many of these issues. Um, how much of that, you know, for when you when you sit with state governments, um, are they are they savvy about? Do they look to you to try to help to break that down, or do you think that they track these global issues? Uh, I'm wondering as well in the push pull, like you know, so much is happening around the world that's going to impact states' development trajectories. Do you help crack that door open? Because of course you've had such great access and visibility to that and all the roles that you've had. Um. Um, I think uh, there are multiple responses to that, but um, many, as, and you would know this, many of the states have first off chosen to go to consulting firms hmm. for um, uh, packaging, okay? Um, so these investor meets uh, are a big deal. Of course, their visits also abroad, but... Uh, uh, a way in which states are beginning uh, to showcase uh, what they have to offer are 
these uh, fairly big deal uh, investor meets, which I've not attended myself, but uh, they put a lot of effort into. We have not so far helped curate those. Occasionally, we will be asked to bear witness at one of these events, but we don't hold our hand up. So, uh, I mean, what's implicit in that is where you started, which is that that's the dimension of competitive federalism, uh, not unlike U.S. states. Uh, you, uh, there's, I mean, there are some incentives that Indian states can offer, uh, but they're not a lot because a lot of their fiscal capacity has been absorbed into the GST, which is now the goods and services tax, I should say. Mm. Okay. However, Prime Minister Modi at um, the Red Fort uh, in um, August of last year, which, as, which marked the, uh, uh, the 75th anniversary of uh, India's independence in 1947, declared that uh, uh, India should aspire to being a developed country, not economy, developed country in the next 25 years. And um, that has now uh, shifted the time horizons a little bit. So people are certainly talking about the near term, but with the sense that, uh, that where do we fit into this vision? And in turn, um, 2047 is a, is a long way to, uh, to look ahead. But um, the Prime Minister is very clear in his, uh, in his guidance to me that, uh, you know, Niti needs to both figure out and then help, okay, that if, you know, India wants to be at X trillion, then what does that mean for individual states? And that's where I think development strategy comes in and not just packaging. And that's where I hope Niti will be able to help. My final point would be that many of the states, and not only the more advanced states, actually have fairly uh, uh, dense intellectual relationships through the diaspora, through places like CSIS, uh, with sources of knowledge um, outside um, NITI or outside the government system. So, you know, I was uh, talking to somebody at, at uh, Berkeley, and they've got a scheme in for all uh, of all places, Megale. I think it's an indication of the degree to which uh, the uh, intermingling or the uh, of um, the U.S. intellectual community and the Indian intellectual community. People have home states and all of that. So there's a lot of yeastiness in that, and that's just fine. Except that I think Niti needs to be both more alert so that we don't duplicate, and also needs to be more of a medium for um, you know, picking up what's going in state X and bringing it to state Y, and we're looking for machinery to do that. Mm. Yeah, it was a pleasant surprise to me. Uh, last year we were doing a project looking at some small business MSME development policies and really pitching them to state governments in India as a model and a template. And in those conversations with state industry secretaries, uh, places like Tripura, like uh, Puducherry, both had, had raised this question to us uh, as a Washington think tank, we're hearing about this China plus one. How do we, as small states in India, take advantage of that? So it is exciting to see that even the places that maybe didn't get as much attention 25 years ago, uh, just yesterday hosting an industry delegation from the state of Arunachal, you know, I don't remember that happening before as well. So it is great to see that even those states that are a little bit out of the limelight, a little bit smaller, are starting to think about global ships and what that might mean. But let's shift to, uh, I think, probably uh, the raciest topic that we have on ranking states. Um, prior to Niti's creation, I remember every couple of years, uh, a business publication or a trade association in India would look to rank Indian states on business or development priorities, and the political pressures became very difficult. Niti has moved into that space with reckless abandon. Every topic you can practically think of on health and innovation, uh, Niti is coming out with these indexes, and while they characterize even the lower ones as, you know, aspirers or they find some way to do it, you know, clearly there's a ranking there. How has that, you know, resulted? I mean, what kind of pressure do you feel from states when they end up on that? Or do they look when they're at the lower end and say, you know, this is where I need help, come and, come and, come and help? It was always viewed as kind of a third rail uh, from Delhi. 
and, and your organization has moved into it uh, tremendously. So I'm wondering what the uh, response has been on that. Uh, encouragement, this is ways to help, or you know, pushback and complaints. Uh, I wonder if you could shed some light on that. Well, I haven't heard too many in my first year, but then uh, you know, I'm still in that sense a rookie. Um, what, uh, so I'm most aware of, uh, as it were, of rankings in two areas. One, sustainable development goals, and second, aspirational districts. And so let me uh, just speak a little bit to, to those. Uh, but let me add that uh, many of these rankings do depend on data sources which may be uneven across states. Um, and we try and make that disclaimer uh, visible. Uh, uh, but to just short circuit to my response to your question, so far I've seen it as a, uh, as a spur to action rather than a, uh, uh, a challenge that, look, we don't uh, agree uh, with this. But back of that is obviously a, peer, uh, a process of you know, dialogue and engagement so that people have ownership over those numbers. But I think the most, in, you know, a, a, a test case which I'm more aware of, or a case study, I should say, not a test case, is the sustainable development goal. Mm -hmm. So um, many in your audience would know that the sustainable development goals were formulated by the United Nations uh, uh, in 2015 as a global resolution. And uh, uh, Prime Minister, that was soon after Pri Prime Minister Modi took office. He was there to, uh, to provide India's uh, assent to that as a global resolution. And then in 2017, uh, this got turned into a set of indicators that get monitored globally. Niti Aayog uh, was given charge as the nodal agency for um, taking forward India's performance on the Sustainable Development Goals. And my predecessors made the wise judgment that it made relatively little sense for this just to be a national level effort mm. because the actions that needed to be taken were largely at the state level. And uh, hats off uh, to the uh, officers who had to do this. They really went on a roadshow to individual states and communities and consultations to say why this was um, a roadmap for how a state should see its own report card hmm. um, and, um, uh, and a attempt to achieve, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to a higher performance for its own sake. So I think the debate has moved more to are we doing better now than Previously, if so, why? Recognizing that we keep adding indicators, so it's a you know it's not a very stable um, uh, metric. Um, I must say, for myself as an analytic exercise, uh, I would also want to adjust for uh, for real per capita income or some other some other indicator, because um, but. Let me make one additional point about the concept of the SDGs, because that is important. Uh, the, S the SDGs are really a formulation of what ought to be the basic obligations of a society to its citizens. So in that sense, it applies to the US just as much. It's not only developing countries, A. And B, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not an excuse to say we don't have the resources because it's, it's saying that th 
this minimum package is non-negotiable. Now, clearly, getting rid of poverty takes resources. That's sustainable development goal number one. So uh, there's ownership over this. There's ownership over uh, the data collection process. And because there is that kind of ownership, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that the focus is on uh, state improvement. And particularly if there's been a change of guard, it's, it's a, uh, and again, Niti's neutrality and objectivity are important to create this. Uh, uh, if I could just talk, because it's a flagship program, both of Niti and of the Prime Minister, we have something called the Aspirational Districts Program. And uh, uh, the insight behind this uh, um, was the Prime Minister's, uh, which is that, uh, to use the language of Econom uh, economics, that you are well within the frontier of possibility, even in some of the poorest, um, some of the most backward districts. So 112 districts have been selected in India and for intensive monitoring. This is largely a um, call to action for civil servants, less for the local um, uh, political um, structures, um, and we, um, uh, we publicize, certainly internally to the Prime Minister, occasionally externally, the relative ranking of different districts. And it's, it's been remarkable how that competition amongst the aspirational districts and that intensive focus on monitoring has produced uh, very rapid catch-up, so much so that the Prime Minister now wants to take this forward to, um, to a level that we call the block. So um, uh, these are examples perhaps of competitive federalism, but they are really uh, the product of intensive monitoring, which is where we started. On the cooperative side, and uh, we can, that's a separate discussion, we can talk of the way in which states came together at the time of COVID, mm. for example, and uh, uh, you know, accepted a common challenge, and maybe um, climate change is going to be one such uh, challenge looking ahead. Well, there's, uh, I, I think for few th future times, if we get to do this again, uh, talking about districts in an area too that we haven't yet plunged into, but seeing the government a lot more interested in is uh, urban development with yes. uh, the RBI's new annual report on municipal finance, the finance minister helping ring fence as per the budget. So, yeah, we, we think we're pretty neat for getting to the state level here from Washington, but there's so much happening below that, as you point out, the district level. Something, though, that you, you, you kind of touched on early, and I want to I hit it on it a little bit more directly. We know that you've got, you know, team experts there and team leads that cover a variety of topics, reports that come out that cover so many different sectors and topics. How, you know, does it actually work with, with you, your work at NITIOG, and the line ministries to coordinate when these things come around? Is there a formal tool for doing so? You mentioned the governing council. You've got some ministers that are That's there. Yeah. But is there something that is formal, you know, because I, I know a lot of these reports get to a bit more of a technical level. So how is it that you engage the line ministries in your work and make sure that, you know, you're working towards a, towards a common uniform goal in a lot of these areas? Well, I'm the beneficiary of a large volume of work that uh, has taken place uh, before I got there, so I'm seeing the you know uh, the end of the sausage making process, and we're beginning now to start on a new uh, phase or cycle. So let me give you. We've been talking about in, uh, the Niti and the states, and now we're going to be talking really about Niti and the Ministry, union ministries yeah. or the line ministries, and they are you know uh, very different um, forms of engagement, um, and in some ways I would say Niti. Uh, uh, while its mandate and its thrust is towards the states, the reality of our day-to-day -day work is more sort of within the beltway, within, uh, <laughs> within the ring road, uh, if you will. Um, now, uh, the guidance from the Prime Minister is very clear uh, on two points. First, he actually 
is quite happy if Niti uh, took on something of the role of internal consultants that, you know, if we believe from a process point of view or a structural point of view at the union levels, like, uh, if you like, uh, these things are also political, that uh, some process, uh, you know, could be improved or, uh, so we have the we have the mandate, if not the capacity, to make comments on process as well, uh, because as as uh, was pointed out to me uh, soon after I took over, uh, there are really only three parts of the union government that have um, um, oversight or uh, over all of government. There's uh, the cabinet secretary. There's the Prime Minister's office, and then there's Niti. And in the technical areas, it's really only Niti. There's also uh, an Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, but they are, uh, they, they are less organically linked. I mean, they're special topics um, kind of group. Okay, so um, uh, there's the question of how ideas originate, and then there's the question of how, or incubate, and then how they get uh, taken up uh, for implementation. So uh, the Prime Minister's vision is that uh, while people will pitch to the line ministries, lobbyists, uh, analysts, this, that, and the other, um, uh, they don't have the structures for uh, fresh thinking, scanning the horizon, and that's what he wants Niti to be doing, mm. but it's doing it within a, if you like, a, a political and uh, uh, framework that uh, comes from uh, the Prime Minister. And I do want to make the point that our uh, eight years of existence have all been when we've had a prime minister who has an, a majority in parliament. So we've been shaped by those political circumstances. But let's just take, for example, uh, the whole um, emissions climate uh, sort of space. Uh, I could take others, but this is something that your audience would be more, more familiar with. So firstly, uh, the political decision that India was going to be an active player in the global uh, climate scene was Prime Minister Modi's decision by uh, signing up um, at uh, Paris uh, to, to being an, uh, uh, a, a fully committed member of the Paris Agreement and then committing to aggressive uh, nationally developed uh, uh, contributions. Prior to that, though, India already had a um, an action plan on climate change, um, even under the previous government with various pillars or very, and um, but since Prime Minister Modi, a bit like the Sustainable Development Goals, had signed up to this, there was then a welter of uh, thought in the intellectual community in government about what some of the promising. Um, technologies and directions were that needed to be pursued. And so um, electric vehicles was one. Green hydrogen was another. Uh, ethanol blending was a third. Th at a lower level of maturation is now a discussion on small modular reactors. Carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which you know, in my time at Shell has been considered fanciful um, and uh, unaffordable, came back on, onto uh, the agenda. Um, and um, so Niti commissioned work in each of these areas, which was, uh, and there, there's similar work that's been going on on, on the the digital side, I, but I just want to make this concrete, 
And so there were then a series of studies, uh, not necessarily done by Niti uh, itself, um, but it's, uh, Niti has the convening power, so as it were, the advisory group, even if it's, if it's going to be done by consultants. Um, and then it becomes the responsibility of the line ministry, first at the bureaucratic level, then at the political level, to decide, so does this go to cabinet or not go to cabinet? So I would say uh, staff work uh, that uh, is commissioned by Niti on an agenda that's aligned with broader goals is uh, one form of uh, engagement. But uh, to come back to what we were talking about earlier, um, the Prime Minister certainly sees Niti not only as a, an incubator, but also then having a very monitoring, uh, important monitoring function. So something like our production-linked incentive scheme. So how's it going? And uh, we may have been responsible for some of the original ideas, then it became uh, the topic of the ministries, but you know, if there's somebody that the minister, uh, that the prime minister wants to turn to on PLI or how are the uh, uh, the major infrastructure projects going, so he turns to Niti, and that gives Niti a seat at the table uh, in monitoring progress of the of the ministries. Well, that's a lot of a lot of angles to uh, you know to have your foot in the door for for key, key things that are happening, whether you trigger them or not, and even the PLI program. Appears that you may have uh, triggered some moves here in the United States as well, as we're looking back towards industrial policy for getting a leg up in some right. of the well, you know, industrial it, area. <laughs> where India leads, the world follows. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking at, you know, you kind of hinted at it before, uh, cooperative federalism. You know, we think of the rankings and the competitive nature that you're trying to stoke there, but cooperative federalism. And there's obviously some critical topics on pollution control or water sharing and things like that, or even electric mobility. Some of the work we've been doing on charging, you know, if you've got range anxiety, you have states clumped together around an urban area. If they don't plan together, people won't know, you know, there's so many areas on co cooperative federalism where regional groupings or nationwide states should probably be consulting a little bit more. How, how do you look at the role that Niti is going to play on cooperative? The competitive side, I think we have a pretty good picture for, but what, is, what does cooperative look like and how do you get states to work together, especially when they may have different political interests or different development interests? How, how does that look like in practice? What do you see the role? Well, I was not in this role um, during COVID, but uh, I mean, that was a common mm. challenge and, uh, you know, two billion vaccinations, the, the Arogya Setu app, the Cohen app, all of this could not have been done by the central government on its own. So it was um, a whole Team India effort. Um, I think we are, again, behind the frontier, Rick, on this in the following sense. I've already indicated that um, there's a lot of innovation happening at the state level. and. Uh, so two points. One is uh, we are, I think, too wedded to a hub-and-spoke model in our inter interaction with the states, and we need on a thematic basis uh, to find ways for states to learn from each other. And I, I'm not aware that that is happening as much as it might, and that would be uh, us acting as a platform rather than, you know, uh, um, rather than uh, being more uh, in the role of a producer or a director. Um, but a different way uh, of um, visualizing India's trajectory to becoming a developed um, country by a developed society, better than either country or economy, developed society in the next 25 years, a lot of which is going to have to depend on what happens on human development and um, you know safety nets and all of that is um, to work hard at making best practice common practice hmm. so I mean yes we can learn from the rest of the world but we you know we can learn from each other 
And I don't think we're doing that enough. And so being systematic about that as well, uh, you know, uh, again, not in a competitive sense, that why is it that, uh, you know, a relatively affluent state is behind on certain important indicators while another hill state is doing better. Uh, so uh, it's a research agenda, but then even once you've done the research, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a diffusion agenda. And I think uh, we haven't scratched the surface there, but I can see uh, how that uh, could be a very powerful uh, medium for Niti to, to be helpful uh, to, to the states. Now, uh, there are other fora, so the Home Minister has an interstate council which meets regionally, but those tend to be, you know, on, on law and order issues, or administrative issues, uh, whereas our shtick, I think, should be uh, development, development strategy. What can states learn from each other, particularly about implementation, because that's that's what they know, that's what they understand. I would just make one point that I omitted earlier talking about our relationship with the line ministries. Um, I find, and this is not specific to this government, but I don't think it has changed under this government, um, that government of India tends to think in terms of schemes. And schemes are government directed with goals and budgets. But the underlying uh, notion that uh, you need the private sector to get with the program, which we've achieved in some ways with renewables, I would say we haven't, but uh, the notion which is so prevalent in the US that what government needs to be thinking about is incentives and policies so that the private sector plays its role rather than schemes, which are about the role of the government. I think that shift in perspective is important at the state level mm. and at the national level. I remember uh, the inaugural vice chairman was talking about states as laboratories for reform, um, but it's a mixed bag. You know, Not every state that we engage with has the technical capacity to kind of reach for the best. We see that like in electric mobility policy where if you look at the, the elements that different states have in their policies, there's huge variability. Some, you know, almost forget uh, consumer incentives focusing on invest, uh, you know, for manufacturing incentives and such. And areas like the Model Shops and Establishments Act, which the Delhi's, which Delhi's been pitching to states, there you've got more uniformities. Um, less laboratory for reform, but you know that it's kind of meeting a, a certain sort of level uh, standard there. So. Uh, I think what you're saying makes uh, makes a lot of sense, you know, in meeting states where they're most interested in, in sort of engaging. Um, you know, I, I, with energy policy, you know, I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit as well. Uh, so many uh, tough issues or interesting issues and opportunities that India is grappling with. Um, the desire to be more self-reliant and manufacturing the products that go into it. Uh, so many plans by the line ministries. You've got so many that cover energy issues, and ultimately, application of that happens at the uh, at the state level. So I just wonder if you can opine, you know, what does India's energy future over the next 10 or 15 years looks like? Are you going to have a, an acceleration of renewables further? Is hydrogen going to meet the promise that's kind of on the table? Uh, coal and gas will certainly be there. And what are the areas on the energy mix that states are more excited in engaging, you know, uh, New Delhi or engaging the rest of the world on? So with your energy background, I wonder if you can just take a minute and talk about this incredible set of issues that kind of land on your table when you take over this role at Niti Ayog. And, and where you think the immediate future is going to look like for um, center-state cooperation on energy and climate? Wow, that's huge. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so, uh, you know, we have these uh, two handholds, I was, but maybe one should think of them as three. There's, the, uh, there were the 2022 goals uh, that came out of Paris, the 2030 uh, goals that came out of Glasgow, then there were the, you know, there was the commit, not the commitment, but there was an indication, not yet formally committed, of net zero by 2070. Uh, the um, uh, MOEFCC 
uh, filed a long-term uh, low-carbon sort of trajectory with, um, with the COP um, at uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, and that's an interesting, well-written document. Um, I would say that uh, we've, that uh, philosophically, we are going down the route of uh, regulation, subsidy, exhortation, not unlike the US, no. <laughs> because uh, the, uh, the pricing route uh, seems more tricky, uh, but partly because of what's happening globally with the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, partly because of our own success with the, uh, you would know what the PAT uh, acronym stands for, perform something and transfer, um, uh, the, the, the scheme for trading uh, yeah. emissions uh, permits amongst uh, polluting industries. So, uh, so uh, those are some of the, uh, as it were, policy directions at a national level that uh, that this long-term um, document uh, articulates. Clearly, a large part of the focus is going to be on uh, decarbonizing the power sector and elect electrifying more, mm. and. Um, I'll talk about the urban piece uh, a little later, but um, now there, the key issue is really intermittency, grid stability, storage, and storage for the power system, but also storage for mobility, uh, like um, the uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the e-mobility uh, diamond dimension, which in India is much more associated with two and three wheelers than it's associated with, uh, with, with uh, uh, four, four, wheel, uh, four wheelers or four vehicles. And then there's uh, the decarbonization of transport, where railways are already committed to all of this. But none of this, and I won't talk, I'm talking mainly about mitigation, none of this works until you've decarbonized the electricity supply itself. So we go back to you know, that set of issues. Um, now, the state dimension on this um, is that, firstly, a lot of the investment uh, in the grid is going to have to take place uh, also with state participation. But most importantly, and you know what an old chestnut of a problem this is, that our whole renewables um, investment, unlike the old thermal investment, is by private entrepreneurs, mm. and therefore regulation, sanctity of contract, being paid on time, so that you know it doesn't become unaffordable because there's payment risk in this. So issues that up till now have been you know ad addressed but not satisfactorily at the state level about the viability of DISCOMs will be absolutely central to this whole scheme. So that's a national, uh, pro uh, a national goal, but which depends crucially on what's happening at the state level, at the state kind of uh, DISCOM level. Let me just talk a little bit uh, about uh, cities, because um, I think we don't, and I was had, I had very interesting discussions on U.S. campuses uh, in the last uh, week. Um, there's a lot of ground-level ferment uh, in terms of NGOs, and uh, but I don't uh, I don't know that we have either a political or a. Uh, um, a technical template for how cities should evolve in the way that they need to evolve uh, to, for them to be, uh, to have a lower uh, carbon footprint than urban sprawl would generate. 
what, um, what I did learn from my time at Shell is that one way of baking in a low carbon footprint is through urban design. Um, and that's one reason why um, European city, uh, countries and cities have typically half the footprint, the, the uh, emissions footprint of Canadian, US, Australian cities. It's just because they're more compact. Oh, you've got the, the, the Chinese uh, alternative, which is to build vertically. So all of this comes together. Uh, we can't have India grow without states growing. States can't meet their growth aspirations unless their cities grow, and their cities are not set up to grow in a green and productive fashion given our urban uh, governance structure. And it's much more than just municipal finance. There's some talk about municipal finance. So to me, as it were, thinking up or down that food chain is going to be something that, uh, that is going to be important to Niti and important in our engagement with states. And I'm pleased to say that a lot of um, uh, intellectual firepower by think tanks, NGOs, etc., is going into this, but I don't think it's come together into a coherent view of mm -hmm. what we need to be doing. Well, and it may end up and be one of the useful areas of U.S.-India cooperation coming forward now that we have a former mayor of Los Angeles as our ambassador Absolutely. after a, a long gap there. So it's uh, terrific to see uh, Ambassador Garcetti taking office. To that last point you brought up, uh, let me ask, I mean, I know going back to my early days at U.S. India Business Council, the business community, foundations, NGOs, think tanks, a lot of them have always looked at the Planning Commission or Niti Aayog as kind of a first stop. You know, we, we see these big targets India's announcing, we want to invest, we want to support, we want to partner. You must have a lot of organizations kind of knocking at the door at all times. Um, what, in a, in a successful way, does that kind of look like? Who shows up and has a good meeting with Niti to partner with you as a, as a research partner, as a funding partner? What, what does that kind of look like for, for initial meetings? How, how, how should international organizations look at uh, engaging Niti as successfully as they can in areas that you've kind of defined? I, I know it's a bit of a, a broad topic, but Niti comes up constantly by the global community whether it's climate, whether it's transportation. So what, what does a successful kind of partnership look like with, with foreign or international organizations? Rick, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm in a different role at a different level, but I still think that advice that I was given when I was at Shell uh, is something that people from outside should keep in mind. So Shell had had a very rich and productive uh, engagement with the Chinese government on partic particularly their gas strategy um, as part of their overall energy strategy. And the way that came about was at the China Development Forum, which is where CEOs meet with uh, um, the ch Chinese leadership. Um, the CEO of Shell at that time, Peter Vosa, was mandated by... Uh, I think it was Hu Jintao, whoever it was before uh, Xi Jinping, um, that um, uh, after a lot of back-channel uh, back discussion, that our development research center will work with Shell to, as it were, do a medium-term uh, uh, vision for China's gas hmm. uh, sector. And I knew sort of innately, but, um, but check this out, that there was no way that uh, the planning commission of that day, but even the Niti of this day, was going to reach out to a multinational and say, tell us what to do. That's just not the way things work in India. So what was the alternative that was recommended to me? Uh, I was told, uh, because we, I was asked to lead a study on, on um, energy scenarios for India, you know, work with some think tanks, make, keep the planning commission there, Niti now aware of what you're doing, try and get some support from them, but don't expect them to endorse or badge it, but uh, be sufficiently visible that, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, when the work comes out or when Niti's ready, 
it's not buried in obscurity and the business of working with a local think tank was also sound advice because uh, India is you know nationalistic enough whatever you want that if it's just an elegantly produced uh, document that comes from abroad it will be looked at so they we have that ten times over here in the states of course too we don't want anybody on the outside telling us so uh, yeah, okay so all I'm saying is sure. that <laughs> that dealing with uh, other local entities because they then become your advocates it's mm. much easier for a ministry or me or whatever to reach out to um, uh, to NGOX or think tank why so they need to be full partners and then uh, it makes it easier for you know us to then bring them into the discussions we have the convening power so there's a question and incidentally uh, you know since I've been a think tanker for quite a while that's also what the theory of policy change suggests change doesn't happen because somebody writes a report change happens when you know there's a political moment that but then at that time people draw on the staff work and so to be anticipating the issues of the future as we you know I think Neeti has done with CCUS uh, and Neeti you know to some extent falls into that uh, but, uh, so that uh, when the time uh, when it's time to move then there is uh, uh, a set of sensible ideas because if you don't have that then you're just going to get some crazy ideas uh, which are just the result of lobbying so I think a very important part of Neeti's role is to be a foil for bad ideas and you know there are lots of bad ideas and they come into ministries through all kinds of channels we accept that ministries are political entities but then you know there's also I guess is that the role that OMB kind of plays? I don't know, mm. but uh, it's the kind of role we could that uh, uh, we're set up to play. Whether we could do better is a different issue. No, that's a, that's a brilliant articulation. Uh, it comes up a lot, you know, trying to help partner and find those opportunities and avenues. And I think you gave the perfect response for that. The, the last thing I want to wrap up on: you, you've got this window at this agency. You've done so many fascinating things. You know, looking at uh, the economy globally, looking at India from a variety of vantage points, what sort of things do you want to put your personal uh, stamp on uh, in this period where you're going to be running, you know, this, uh, this vital organization? Well, you know, um, uh, I, I, I don't want, uh, uh, that, that, that's not the animating um, sort of desire, but uh, two or three things. Uh, one is, um, we assign um, topics uh, amongst myself and the members um, and while I have some experience in energy there are others uh, particularly uh, on the technology side uh, uh, Dr. Saraswat who knows a lot um, so I, w I think that this urban piece mm -hmm. and trying to give that some shape uh, that's something that uh, I would really like to, to kind of um, see uh, how much progress uh, we can make. And by the way, this is pushing at an open door with uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, because, as he said at our last, last Governing Council meeting, India was going to urbanize. It's our choice whether we do it well or badly. Mm. But he doesn't actually, I think, have presented to him what doing it well means. Okay. There's a little bit on urban finance, and you know Hardeep Puri is uh, a very energetic person. I think he would be very open to ideas that came from Niti. Of course, he has to handle uh, petroleum and natural gas as well, uh, so it would be more at the secretary level. So that I think is something. I actually two other areas that I'd mention since time is short. One is that uh, I think for employment. If India could have breakthroughs in tourism, I think this could really be major. And it's a bit of a puzzle why we are stuck where we are when all around us. So I think that if employment is, you know, everywhere, uh, maybe not in the U.S. at the moment, 
really what politicians want, then I do think tourism has a lot of, um, um, of scope. And finally, because I was a part-time member of the uh, um, Statistical Commission, if there's anything Neethi can do to improve both the image and the quality of Indian data, so these might be, I mean, I've never thought of it like this, but you push, pushed me uh, <laughs> like a good friend should. So I would say these are three areas where I might now, after this conversation, put my shoulder to the wheel. Oh, that's fantastic. Suman, I can't thank you enough for taking your time out of your busy schedule while you're traveling all throughout the United States to come by CSIS and have this conversation. It's a, it's a little technical in nature, but you know that's what our program is trying to focus on, the nuts and bolts, cooperation, the areas that are on the agenda. And India is on the front page, not just for demographic dividend, but hosting the G20. Of course, uh, some big visits happening uh, both ways uh, in the rest of the year. Our leaders will see each other uh, every three minutes, I think, for the rest of the year. So <laughs> yeah. it's a phenomenal time, and uh, you're such a phenomenal person for India to have, and, and lucky to do so in this critical role. So thank you again for joining us here today. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. I have known CSIS in other contexts as well. Shell had a good, uh, strong relationship on the energy front. I certainly follow um, your scoring of reform, the work that you do on, on energy, and I certainly hope that yeah, Neeti will benefit more from the work that you do at the level of states. Right. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you.